safer lawns and pets. Peskill, protecting your home from the outside. Call us now to find out more or visit our website today. to you, it matters to us. We're Cayman 27, Cayman Informed. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Clifton Hunter High School for the first East End Candidates Forum, the first of 19 forums of the 2017 election year. For those who don't know me, I'm Chamber President Kyle Broadhurst, and I'll be serving as the panelist this evening. When the Chamber was established in 1965, the goal was to create an institution that supports, promotes, and protects the interests and welfare of its members and the wider community. Being nonpartisan, we've hosted forums every election year since the 1980s. For eight elections, we have provided members of the community with an opportunity to meet their candidates and educate themselves before Election Day. The Chamber of Commerce has prioritized education as a key focus for 2017 and the foreseeable future. And these forums are just one of the many efforts we'll use to focus on education. Another public educational campaign that you'll be seeing much more of in the coming weeks and months is the Growth Matters initiative. You may have seen this campaign on your Facebook, social media, and local media news feeds, and you may have visited the growthmatters.ky website. For those who haven't, this initiative is a series of 10 animated educational and fun videos that are intended to educate viewers on the importance of economic growth and how it is achieved. The videos also show the, how the government generates revenue to spend on essential public services. Our aim of this series is to start a conversation about economic growth within the community. The Chamber will also be taking the videos into all high schools to encourage discussion among the Cayman youth. But today is about East End. We recently distributed an election survey to the chamber, chamber membership from which we have developed a series of national and constituency questions. We've also, invite, we've also invited and accepted questions from the public, and you are welcome to submit your own this evening for review. If you do wish to submit a question this evening, please ensure that it's directed to all candidates. Personal questions directed at single candidates will not be permitted. These forums have taken weeks of preparation, and we are pleased to be here tonight in your district we hope that this opportunity to meet your candidates will prove beneficial to you. I would like to thank the Chamber staff for their hard work in organizing these events. I'd also like to extend a wholehearted thanks to Hurley's Media for their support and assistance in broadcasting these forums live on Cayman 27 and online. With their help, we've ensured that all members of the community can hear from their candidates. Finally, I'd like to thank the DART organization, Deloitte, Fosters, IGA, Heritage Holdings, and Perot Cleaners for their support. This evening would not be possible without your support. The moderator for this evening is Mr. Will Pineau, Chief Executive Officer of the Chamber. He will now explain the rules for tonight's forum and will introduce the candidates. Well, thank you, Kyle, and good evening. Here are the rules for tonight's forum. Each candidate will be asked 10 questions. You'll have two minutes to elaborate on each question if you choose to do so. I'll notify you when the timer has elapsed, and we will then move on to the next candidate. Each candidate will be allowed to answer the question without interruption and is free to differ with an opinion or position of a fellow candidate during their allotted response time. Candidates should deal solely with the issues. No personal attacks will be tolerated. At the conclusion of the forum, each candidate will be allowed two minutes to deliver a closing statement. And at the conclusion of question time, we'll accept written questions from the audience. I would ask that you direct, as Mr. Broad has previously said, that your question is directed to all the candidates. The seating arrangement for tonight's uh, forum is um, randomly selected. Each of the candidates drew randomly for their seating. And as the forum is being broadcast on Cayman 27 and online, we will take some commercial breaks. And at this time, before I introduce the candidates into tonight's forum, um, we're going to take that first commercial break. So thank you for watching the first of 19 Chamber of Commerce candidates forums right here from East End this evening. So please stay tuned. We'll return to the Clifton Hunter High School right after these short messages. 
You're right. I mean, if Jennifer asked for something really disturbing for her birthday deal, I, I don't know how I'll handle it. My guess is not well. I mean, maybe I'm worried about nothing. I mean, what's the worst she can ask for? Props, you in a cheerleader outfit, a third party involved, not necessarily a lady. <laughs>27, watch as some of the world's most talented people put their skills to the test as they attempt to make their mark in the record books. You'll witness some of the craziest, scariest, most bizarre stunts people will do all in the name of stardom. It's the ultimate Guinness World Records and it's right here on Canaan 27. Join us on Wednesdays at 7.30 to capture all the action. Welcome back to the Clifton Hunter High School where we have the first of 19 candidates forums that are put on by the Chamber of Commerce. Now I'd like to introduce the candidates for the Electoral District of East End. We'll begin with Mr. Isaac Douglas Rankin. Isaac Douglas Rankin, he's an entrepreneur and business owner, having started his own telecoms consulting and contracting company in 2003. He is currently working towards the completion of a BA in business management. His great-grandfather was Captain George Dixon, after whom the park in East End is named. Isaac is seeking election as an independent candidate for East End. Welcome, Isaac. Thank you. The next candidate is John McLean, Jr. He comes from a family with a political background in the Cayman Islands. He's a graduate of the John Gray High School and the University College of the Cayman Islands. He has ran both in 2009 and 2013 elections. John is seeking election as an independent candidate for East End. Welcome, John. Thank you. Mr. Arden McLean was first elected to the Legislative Assembly in 2000. He served in the cabinet from 2005 to 2009 as minister responsible for communications, works, and infrastructure. He's currently serving his fourth term in the Legislative Assembly and is seeking re-election as an independent candidate for East End. Welcome, Mr. McLean. Thank you. I now turn it over to Mr. Broadhurst, who will pose the first question in tonight's forum. Mr. Rankin, I believe we're going to start with you. The first question is, please tell us a little about yourself and the qualifications that you possess that make you the best candidate to represent the people of East End in the Legislative Assembly. Um, for those of you who hadn't been here, my name is Isaac Douglas Rankin, and I feel that I present that the best candidate to represent East End because of my background. I, Grew up in East End. I come from um, a line of hardworking men and women in the district. I have my own business, so I understand what it takes to run a business, and I believe I am duly qualified to represent the people in the district. Thank you. Uh, would you like me to repeat the question, Mr. McLean? Or no, that's fine. Um, I think I'm the best candidate by far because. I, for one, definitely live in the district, and I know the ins and outs of what's going on in my district daily. Um, I have East End at heart from birth. I was bred to lead, I was bred to, to help, and I want to better my people in East End. My, my people in East End deserve better leadership, and that's the reason that I'm running. 
Thank you. Mr. McLean? Well, obviously, with my experience, having served four terms with the, for the people of East End as a representative, um, with their blessing, I believe I have gained enormous experience in representing not only the district of East End in particular, but this country in general. And I have proven that I am capable of representing the district. I have been known as the action man. I get things done. I get things done because of the experiences that I gained prior to going into, into politics and subsequently. And I believe that no candidate in the district of East End is more capable than I am at this stage to further represent the people of East End. Thank you. Our next question, and I'll start with you, Mr. McLean, Jr. What do you consider to be the top community issue facing the district, and what would you do to address it if elected? Um, for the district of East End, I think the unemployment has soared in recent times, and I would definitely work closely with the immigration department in regards to work permits holders in the district to curtail um, our people not given prime choice for any business that's in the district. To me, that's the, you know, that's number one for my priority list. Thank you. Mr. McLean? One you asked for? Yeah, I can repeat it for you. It's, what do you consider to be the top community issue facing the district, and what would you do to address it if elected? Well, well I, I believe that employment is a, a major issue in, in the district. Um, I have publicly stated that I believe the time has come for us to put moratorium on work permits in certain categories, that uh, cabinet has that authority to do that, um, to give directives, until we are comfortable that Caymanians are all placed. That is those who want to work and those who are capable of working. You cannot expect to have in this country over 100 people with post-secondary education and are out of work. And some of those are within the community of East End. And it's time now that we ensure that East Enders become a part of this economy and Caymanians by and large as well. I think that it is necessary for us to develop a, a, a database where we know exactly, and I'm not talking about the one at NWDA, I'm talking about one that is going to be effective and efficient, where we know exactly who we have out of work, and it doesn't take a very long time to do. And every, anyone who wants a work permit coming into this country has to go through a department, which I would like to term as the human resources department in this country, where everyone is registered and if you want a permit, then you have to first see if there is anyone available within that department. And that goes for EastEnders in particular and the country in general. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rankin, do you want me to repeat the question? Or are you? Sure. Okay. What do you consider to be the top community issue facing your district? And what would you do to address it if elected? Um, I certainly won't disagree with the other two members on the platform, but I see a lack of employment opportunities amongst our constituents as the main district issue. We need to take a different approach um, to create more employment opportunities for East Enders, especially the young people. For far too long, they've been neglected and denied opportunities to work and attain gainful employment. Many of the working age individuals, especially those that are involved in the skilled and non-skilled areas, are challenging in attaining unemployment and we must change and create a technical vocational environment to train our young people, especially those because the last statistics that was done, the company was statistics in 2015, indicated there were over 7,000 work permits that were issued for technical and vocational jobs. We have a problem in East End that they, they, they've, been, they've been neglected, as I said before. But we need to have two clear paths for the people that come out of East End and school. One that certainly directs them to tertiary and higher education, 
and the second part, you must enter into an apprenticeship program that would allow them to get further training and employment. Thank you very much. Um, the next question, I'll start with you, Mr. McLean. We've talked about your top community issue, and I, I anticipate that the unemployment issue actually crosses over into this as well. But I wanted to ask you about what you think is the top national issue, and the question is this. There are many issues being discussed by the candidates in this year's election. If you had to identify one national issue that you could address if elected, what would that issue be, and please share your plan to address it? Well, I believe the one national issue was employment, or the unemployment is important. The one national issue that I have, and I believe needs to be addressed, is education. We need to ensure that our people are educated. For too long, we have heard the Chamber of Commerce and the businesses say that our people are not prepared for the workforce. Now, how we do that, we need to properly reform education in the devolution of the administration of, of education down to the schools. We have to get it in the schools where teachers are held responsible, the management of the schools. Now, there is talk of, of, of using um, communities to be a part of councils, create councils to, to manage the schools. I am not adverse to that, but certainly we have to, to look at it and see how that can be done. Um, charter schools we're talking about as well. Um, but we need to find some way that education is not managed from the top. It needs to be managed from the bottom and goals set and responsibilities given to the people at the bottom, the teachers and the whole management of the school. And those people must be held accountable. They have goals and if those goals are not achieved on a yearly basis or a quarterly basis, whatever we want it to be, then somebody must be held responsible. Education is the key. Without education, we will not be employed. Without education, we will have nothing in this country. And it's time, if you're spending 60 million on it now, we need to tax somebody to double that if it's necessary. And that's not building facilities, that is getting good educators in this country. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Rankin, it's the same question, so I'll, I'll read it again for you. There are many issues being discussed by the candidates in this year's election. If you had to identify one national issue that you could address if elected, what would that issue be, and please share your plan to address it? Um, one national issue that I'd like to address if elected is the economic and development diversification from our two main pillars of the economy. Our economy has relied heavily on the financial services and the tourism industry to sustain our local economy for quite a long time. We are increasingly coming under threat, especially on the financial services, from all the regulations in Europe. And our business model, while it's still competitive, we have seen a number of global changes regarding the tax policies. And we could see, see our financial industry come under major threat and be reduced significantly. Now, on the tourism side, we've seen positive statistics on the tourism side that says we probably, I think the stats was that almost three million persons arrived in the country. But that is also not without its own threats because our neighbor to the north, Cuba, um, with the regulatory issues being relaxed by the US, that will create issues for us. Other jurisdictions have also lowered their prices and are consistently towards a consistent talking about the lack of Cayman participation and faces on the front line. We must consider how these things will impact us and look for other areas that we can re derive revenue from. Thank you. Mr. McLean, Jr., I'll read the question for you. There are many issues being discussed by the candidates in this year's election. If you had to identify one national issue that you could address if elected, what would that issue be? And please share your plan to address it. That issue would be employment protection for all Caymanians. Um, in regards to any special government contracts that are being awarded, for example, to security companies at the airport, at the government administration building, 
uh, those those contracts it should be enshrined in those that it's mandatory that they hire locals versus people on work permits. And that would take a strain off of even social services, for example. And any jobs in the Cayman Islands, in my opinion, Caymanians should be put first. It's high time that we stand up and we fight for our own, you know, from across the board. I'm not beating up on any expats. I don't want no one to leave here feeling that way because we obviously cannot sustain all the jobs. But we can eradicate the unemployment in the Cayman Islands, and I will stand for that. Thank you. The next question, Mr. Rankin, we're going to start with you. This question is about education. Education is a vast topic that covers many areas from primary school to vocational training and workforce development. If you had to select only one area of education to focus on, what would that area be? Please explain why and how you would address it. The area of education that I would focus on would obviously be the primary school because that is the building blocks of the whole education system. We have to get away from the perception that one size fits all. We have to begin by identifying the kids in the classrooms at the primary school level who are not going to be moving towards the professional fields like lawyers, doctors, accountants. East End was built on very good tradesmen skills. They had some of the best tradesmen in this country. And we have to identify the kids who we know are going to be professionals and the kids who we know who are going to be tech and vocational, identify that, work with them, and ensure that we provide an alternative path for those kids who are going to be doing technical and vocational training and going, moving towards certification. Thank you. Mr. McLean, Jr., education is a vast topic that covers many areas from primary school to vocational training and workforce development. If you had to select only one area of education to focus on, what would that area be? Please explain why and how you would address it. I must concur with Mr. Rankin. Um, it starts from the primary school. You know, we need to implement the civics back in the school and allow our kids to know where, where we came from in order to know where we're going. And I will definitely focus on East End Primary School once elected to ensure that they're manned with whatever tools they need to accomplish those things. Thank you. Mr. McLean, do you want me to repeat it? Or are you no, that's all right. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. I have formulated my opinion on this a very long time ago. I think it's early childhood. That's where we start. We have failed our children in that early, early childhood education. We have, we have, we have missed, missed the boat on that. And, you know, they can settle for technical and believe that that's the only thing that is, that is available. Well, I believe that every child in this country has the potential of reaching the top. I believe every child in this country has the potential of being whatever they want to be. And I'm not settling for them going to be tradesmen. They must shoot for the moon, and we must provide the necessary resources and the facilities and the capability and so that we can bring out that capability in our children, and I believe it starts at early childhood. And the devolution of the administration of child, of education for children, as I said before, must be, we must, the devolution must happen soon, where the administration and the goals and objectives for our children are sent down to the teachers. And early childhood is where we begin, and that is the formative years of our children. And if we do not capture that, primary school, middle school, junior high, high school will be for naught. We need to start at the bottom, and we need to start at the bottom now. We have no time to waste. Thank you. Mr. McLean, Jr., this question will start with you. Last week, the Chamber unveiled a series of 10 animated videos about economic growth. This subject generates much discussion and differing opinions in our community. What is your position on economic growth here in the Cayman Islands? Especially in the District of Easton, uh, there is a lot of untouched um, economic growth that we can, you know, harvest, the, for example, the I wanted to implement by the record of 10 sales, a well-needed 
craft market. You know, we can utilize our, our local resources and, and capitalize on them. In regards to the to nationally, well, tourism product, we have to protect that and we have to expand on that wherever necessary whilst doing that, not forgetting who we are as a nation, even though we're forced to, to ban at times from outside powers. Thank you. Mr. McLean, would you like me to read the question again? Yeah. If you wish. Okay. <laughs> I, I will. Last week, the Chamber unveiled a series of 10 animated videos about economic growth. This subject generates much discussion and differing opinions in our community. What is your position on economic growth here in the Cayman Islands? Well, economic growth in this country has been on three pillars. Um, one, tourism. Two, financial services. And three, development. That has been our stock market. I believe the time has come to, whilst that has served us well, I believe we need to diversify, find some uh, tech park in this country where we, we can, we can uh, attract people like Google and all of the big high-tech uh, companies in the world and give them incentives. And that will assist us with our e economic growth. Um, we have not tapped in to the development in this country. We, we, we have too much, too many red tapes in the way, too much red tape that prevents us. I am no, uh, no tree hugger, but I also understand that uh, extinction is forever. So I do not want to destroy the environment. So whilst we, we look at the economic growth, this government has said that the CPI is, is minus. Well, um, that would reflect some degree of economic growth as well. Um, but the people are not feeling that. And, and what we need to do is to remove all this red tape in order that development can progress and thus increasing the opportunities for the economic growth. We have done well thus far. We have done very well in, in, in our economy. We are a miracle within a whole big world. Thank you. Mr. Rankin, last week the Chamber unveiled a series of 10 animated videos about economic growth. This subject generates much discussion and differing opinions in our community. What is your position on economic growth here in the Cayman Islands? Thank you, Kyle. Um, actually, I was fortunate enough that I watched two of the videos this morning before I left home. But my position on economic growth is that we need to have some sort of sustainable development. And I would agree with Mr. McLean on that we need to be able to reduce the red tape as well. The economic growth needs to be able to touch all members of our society, not just a select few. We need to be able to ensure that everybody benefits from the economic growth that we can see from development. And yes, we need to also pursue some other pillars that can sustain the economy so that that economic growth can get filtered down to every single person. Well, thank you very much. We've answered six questions so far. Or I haven't, but they have, the East End candidates. Um, thank you for joining us on television, live streaming. So appreciate that. We're going to take a commercial break, and we'll be back with the further questions of our East End candidates. You might not often see us, yet we're always passing through hidden in the background of everything you do. Who are we? We're Home Gas. The clear choice. The world is getting smaller. We travel more. We see more. We do more. So you need a bigger health plan like Premier Health. You have easy access to benefits at home. One million U.S. providers accept your ID card for college, vacation, and business travel. With 24-7 worldwide assistance, U.S. pharmacy benefits, and 96% of claims settled in five days, Premier Health offers you the care you deserve. Brit K, where people come first. BritK.ky we believe that every life matters and that we are all connected. One community, one people. We believe in compassion, 
to give dignity to those that society has let down. We strive to conquer fear, and we believe that the power to heal is a gift. This is who we are. This is what we believe. Holy Cross. It's fresh, fresh from the garden, it's fresh. Fresh from the baker, it's fresh. Fresh from the fisherman, always at her. It's fresh, fresh from the butcher, it's fresh. Fresh from the deli, it's fresh. Fresh from the summer rain, always at her. At Hurley's, everything is fresh, and we mean everything. Welcome back to the Clifton Hunter High School. We're holding the first of 19 candidates forums organized by the Chamber of Commerce. We've gone through the first five questions. I, I said we went through six questions. We've actually gone through five questions. And now what I'm going to do is turn back to President Kyle Broadhurst, who will start the questioning of the candidates. Mr. McLean, we're going to turn our focus uh, back specifically to East End and talk about public safety. Are you satisfied with the resources that have been allocated by the Royal Cayman Islands Police Service to maintain public safety in East End? Absolutely not. I have fought for 16 years to get more and proper policing in East End. I was successful in the last few years to, to get two particular officers appointed to the district of East End. I meet on a regular basis with the police. I have made representations to cabinet about more policing in the district of East End. I have gone and, and, and upgraded the police station, painted it over, done repairs on it, myself and community members, hoping and praying that we would get more policing in the district of East End. The most recent uh, legislative assembly meeting, I questioned the commissioner of police as to when additional resources will be placed in that district. Unfortunately, the government is not providing the financial resources to enhance the police department, which will eventually result in East End and Eastern districts getting more police officers therein. We have proposed that the Bodentown station be developed into a mini police headquarters where all police will be headquartered and all the necessary disciplines and requirements be placed in that and then they are deployed from there into the, the, the other two districts. We have, I have been very unsuccessful with it. I have been made promises by cabinet, by the commissioner of police, by the governor to no avail. They have not responded properly and that is one of the issues that I will be campaigning on this time. The time has come for the police department. The only security means we have in this country to secure our people and they're under resource. Thank you. Mr. Rankin, are you satisfied with the resources that have been allocated by the Royal, Royal Cayman Islands Police Service to maintain public safety in East End? Absolutely not. Not satisfied at all. The, um, I mean, everyone knows from all the public debate that the police have gone to cabinet or the government, elected like government, to, to seek funds to increase um, the members of the police force. The, this lack of policing in the district is, is, is of great concern to many of the members and the residents in the district. Now, when they go and ask some money from cabinet, I think it's incumbent on cabinet and the, and the government to ensure that they get the funds because that is the first point in absence of any sort of, of army or coast guard. They're the only people that we have that is there to protect our shoreline, particularly East End. Thank you. Mr. McLean, Jr., are you satisfied with the resources that have been allocated by the Royal Cayman Islands Police Service to maintain public safety in East End? No, sir, definitely not. Um, 
I would like to actually see behind the police station a dock built where we'd have a search and rescue um, marine patrol boat there manned at all time because many times we have a lot of fishermen that go out beside, outside the reef at night. In fact, just a couple of months ago, a fellow called me and he needed assistance. And of course, there is no police there at the police station. I mean, just about two nights ago in Borden Down, there was two officers that were um, allocated for the Eastern Districts, and that's unacceptable. I mean, if there's an emergency in, in whatever shape or form, there should be someone at the man at the police station. And uh, I commend Mr. McLean for his efforts in trying to, to get the resources in East End. And I think it's high time that all governments, whoever is elected, prioritize these things throughout the Cayman Islands. Because if you're going to assist, you should assist across the board. Don't play politics with people's lives. And I think that's been the problem with the Cayman Islands in regards to the, whoever is elected. Um, I will definitely fight to, to get a policeman there, and it's for various reasons, not only to police um, things that happen in the district that is bad, but also as a presence for our tourism industry. The, to the tourists, I mean, you never know when they need assistance and you don't see no police on the streets in East End. So once elected, I will definitely you know, pursue my, my goals in, in trying to do the best I can and balance the equation in East End. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rankin, I believe we come to you now to answer the question. Uh, this is about uh, one of the biggest developments in your district. Health City Cayman Islands is celebrating its third anniversary. The facility reports that its economic impact since its inception has been U.S. 60 million. Do you support the continued expansion and development of this industry in the district? Yes, I support the continued development and expansion of Health City. Health City while it has its distractors in its developmental stage, has provided a great economic boom to this country through its medical tourism initiative. They are in the process now of, of um, expanding by building residences for the, the medical tourists that come to the country, and it will again expand and create opportunities for EastEnders to get a job there, and I really support that. Thank you. Mr. McLean, Jr., Health City Cayman Islands is celebrating its third anniversary. The facility reports that its economic impact since its inception has been U.S. $60 million. Do you support the continued expansion and development of this industry in the district? Let me tell you all one thing tonight. I would not be here if it was not for Health City. Back in November, they put a stint in my heart, and I can only thank Dr. Ravi and, and the complete staff of Health City. I've been 3,000% behind that plan from the inception, from the time I had knowledge that it's going to happen in the district. Mr. Thompson, he knows I've been supportive of it. And whatever it takes to, to continue the health city, once elected, I will back them 100%. The only drawback I, I have with, with the situation where you have to go to Georgetown in regards to um, emergencies versus directly there, I will definitely try my best to curtail that and allow people to walk right into the, to the hospital because it's there and we need to utilize it. But promoting it and making sure that they have a full backing from my perspective if I'm elected as the MLA, hands down I will, I will be there because it not only benefits me, it benefits my people in East End and they deserve that. Thank you. Mr. McLean, Health City Cayman Islands is celebrating its third anniversary. The facility reports that its economic impact since its inception has been U.S. $60 million. Do you support the continued expansion and development of this industry in the district? Uh, I think the public needs to know that long before Health City was even known about by the public, I met Dr. Shetty and I gave him my commitment then that I would support it. At the time, we did not even know where it was, it, where it was going to be placed. I spoke to Joe Imperato and told him when he called me to show me the plans for the dock, I told him I wasn't supporting the dock, but I would support him selling the property to Health City, so to Shetters at the time, that's what it was being called, to Shetters to do the hospital there. I supported it from its inception. 
long before the public knew about it, and I re meet on a regular basis with Dr. Shetty and uh, the president of Ascension Health, who, who were the partners with Shetty. Um, my most recent visit with them was sometime in November, December. And one of the things I asked them was the expansion of that place to, to include an A&E and, &E and a, a primary institution because their license is for secondary, for tertiary uh, uh, medical care. Um, and of course that changes their business model. I, I, I do know that they just received an ambulance which they're going to be using shortly. Um, one of the things we agreed with Shet at the time when they came in, that was under the, the previous government, was that any um, cardiac problems on the eastern end would go straight to Shetty. That has not been fulfilled because the government continues to carry our people into Georgetown and then assess them there and then take them back. That I have fought for and I will continue to fight for that. And it's unfortunate that we believe at least one East End soul was lost because they had to go to Georgetown. Thank you. Mr. McLean, Jr., this question will start with you. What do you think of the current immigration policies regarding the granting of permanent residency? If you were able to decide on policy changes, what would you recommend? Um, in regards to the permanent residency, uh, that's been a yo-yo for years. Um, I can only say that I think that we need to go back to where we were before in regards to not just the nine years, but maybe extend it more. Because we have to know the person that's going to be living in the society. Um, I would extend that as far as 10 or 12 years, as far as I'm concerned, because they have to they have to be able to contribute something to the society, not just because the nine nine year rollover comes up that they're in a position to to be eligible to be qualified for for permanent residency. Um, I will definitely fight for for that protection and for my people because at the end of the day, when these people come into the society and and implement stuff that is not applicable to us from the other from other nationalities it affects us all so in regards to permanent residency it's a it's an it's a very tricky issue and i hope to god that the people would open their eyes and realize that we need to work together at the end of the day and not fight against each other thank you mr mclean what do you think of the current immigration policies regarding the granting of permanent residency and if you were able to decide on policy changes what would you recommend um, this government has made a total mess of residency in this country. Um, the Premier said that they were going to make it harder for people to become resident, to get residence in the country. And they made a new point system and then they changed that mid-stride after people had all applied. Um, that's unfair, highly unfair to any human being. Um, people uh, apply based on their belief and their expectation that they qualify. I believe the time has come where, and I have made, said this publicly, where Cayman status sh should be for only for spouses and descendants. However, this country was built with the expat help, with foreign help. We need to find some system, whether it's permanent residency or other, that allows people to live in this country for as long as they want. You remember we have the caregiver, which after they, they have served their nine years, can get a caregiver status, um, work permit, and live another five years in the country on that. If we can do it that way, why can't we do something to secure and, and, and other people who live here who are very important to this economy that we talk about, who are very important to the development of this country, give them some degree of, some kind of status that will allow them to live here, but they do not become Caymanians. Everybody, the ultimate thing is that they have to become Caymanian, and, and we cannot sustain that. People must be given the right to live in this country 
for as long as they want without having to jump through all those hoops to become Caymanian. Thank you. Mr. Rankin, what do you think of the current immigration policies regarding the granting of permanent residency? And if you were able to decide on policy changes, what would you recommend? The current immigration policy is, is quite untenable. We have about 970 something persons who are awaiting some, some response on the permanent resident application. Now, as Mr. McLean alluded to, the government really made a mess of that because they indicated that they would have changed it, make it harder, but then eventually made it easier. And then they went back and then changed all the requirements mid stride. We have to give people who have been here, who've contributed to the society, society, some sort of tenure, and so that they can know, don't have um, any issues in their mind. Um, am I going to get this permanent residency? Can I invest in this country? Can I send my children here to school? I mean, we need to be able to answer those questions for them by giving them some sort of tenure. Um, but again, it's, it's a difficult question based on, on how many be people we have there who is really awaiting just answers to the application. Thank you. Mr. McLean, are you in favor or against the government's decision to keep the Georgetown dump at its current location? And or would you support establishing a properly managed facility in another part of Grand Cayman? There is no need to move the dump. I, I spent four years in cabinet and one of my greatest regrets, political regrets, is that I didn't get it done before I left office. I, I spent monies to do studies. I travel throughout the world almost, Europe and North America, looking at facilities. I believe that we need to mine that, that landfill, well, the dump, where it is. I believe that we need to develop a waste energy plant, which is quite capable. Um, if you will look at my study from 2007, it is all there. You can mine it, you can have an industrial um, building and, and, and waste energy plant right there, and, and we, we dispose of all our trash, scrub the, the exhaust, and, and ensure that it's, it's friendly to the environment. It's all possible right there on site. Um, part of my, my, my plans were also to, to have depots within all of the districts where, where the, the districts would dump their stuff there and then it would be collected. Part of the plan was to retrieve all of the garbage and come on back and bring it to Cayman and then we would make electricity out of it. That was the original plan. And the same people who, who, who did that study for us with, and this was bipartisan now because the other side, the members of the opposition were part of that team Ralston Anglin was my accountant at the time, looking at the numbers. Um, we ha had the solution. It just so happened, everybody knows, the economy had a downturn in 2008, and I couldn't secure the financing to do it. If the financing was there, I was going to sign the dotted, dotted line to have a waste energy plant right there on the site. Thank you. Mr. Rankin. Are you in favor or against the government's decision to keep the Georgetown dump at its current location, and or would you support establishing a properly managed facility in another part of Grand Cayman? Um, Kyle, I don't support the facility being expanded at any at all in its current location. What we have to do, we have to get into the program where we're educating our people and, and speak to them about recycling to help reduce what we currently have there. I also agree with Mr. McLean that that landfill could also be mined. If we build a proper waste management facility that has recycling in it, we can build it on another site and reduce the footprint of what we currently have there. But right now, I don't see how continuing with, with expanding the dump and stuff on its current site will, will can be any benefit to us. Thank you. Mr. McLean, Jr. Are you in favor or against the government's decision to keep the Georgetown dump at its current location, and or would you support establishing a properly managed facility in another part of Grand Cayman? I think that um, 
I have to concur with Mr. McLean also. Uh, I think it needs to remain there. Uh, I think that if each district would have a mini, mini dump, so to speak, to reduce the load that's going on in, in the Georgetown landfill, and by the time the rubble gets to there, it's basically you know processed to a degree. I think that's the best approach because uh, I, I don't think any district wants a dump located in the district, and especially in East End, I, I wouldn't support it. Thank you. We're going to take a break at this time. Thank you for tuning in to the first of 19 Chamber of Commerce candidates forums. Tonight we're in the Clifton Hunter High School. We'll return to the forum right after this short commercial break. Someone of them. You hear people talk about the economy all the time. But what is the economy exactly? The economy is the flow of money between the people, the companies, and the government in the Cayman Islands. Why is it important to understand the economy? Well, just like the engine of a car, the better we understand the economy, the better we can make it run, and the more prosperous we can become as a community. The first important thing to understand about the economy is that the private sector is the main source of all wealth. Think about it. Most people work for companies in the private sector, both big companies and small businesses. But even if you work for the government, your salary comes from the fees and duties paid to the government by private sector companies and their employees. That's why we call the private sector the prosperity engine that powers our economy and drives the country forward. When business is booming, companies have more money to spend on salaries, bonuses, and promotions. Employees with more money buy more products and services from other businesses. All those people and businesses spending money generates revenue for the government, which pays for important services like education, roads, emergency services, and care for the elderly. So when the private sector is doing well, everyone does well. But when the private sector isn't doing well, like during a recession, the money dries up and everyone suffers. So when you hear people ask, how do we make our country more prosperous? The answer is pretty simple. Grow the economy. After all, you can't get more money from a system that isn't making more money. That's not economics. That's just common sense. In this video series, we're going to take a closer look at our economy to see how we can fuel our prosperity engine and how to make sure everyone benefits. For now, thanks for watching. And remember to share this video with your family and friends so they can learn more about our economic prosperity engine. If you're looking for extra savings and free benefits with car insurance and home insurance, Brit K has just the cover you need. There's a free $250 gift voucher for new home insurance customers too, and 10% car insurance discount if you have home insurance. With a claim service that's quick and friendly, we call it cover without added costs. Call for a quote on 949-8699 or visit BritK.ky. Brit K, where people come first. Have you had your Tortuga moment today? Come by Tortuga Fine Wine and Spirits for all your liquor needs and taste the world famous Tortuga rum and rum cake. Baked fresh daily in the Cayman Islands. Enchanting, exotic, and always delicious. Like the moments you share and will savor forever. The taste of the Cayman Islands, remembering the time of your life over and over again. Such sweet surrender. At Kirk's Home Center You can find everything to adapt, decorate, or furnish your home at Kirk Home Center. Discover every tool for any task in our hardware department. Fuel your imagination with our extensive range of housewares and linens. Create a home outside your house from our variety of outdoor living items. Or plan your next project in our paint and do-it-yourself section. For the widest variety of stylish and up-to-date items for your home. Make Kirk Home Center your first choice. We got a great deal. Looking for quality products with the best prices? Then come to Uncle Bill's. We carry the best bicycle brands on island. You can also make a custom order and pick up items from our great line of accessories. 
We have a fantastic range of stainless steel, gas, and charcoal grill. And make sure to check out our great line of DeWalt power tools. Plus our newest product, the FlexVolt. Have the freedom of cordless. Come and visit us today, Uncle Bill's Home Improvement Center. Make the most of your morning at Burger King with Burger King's unbeatable breakfast special. Two Chris sandwiches for just $4. Take two bacon, egg, and cheese crust sandwiches, two sausage, egg, and cheese, or mix and match. Add a refreshing OJ or delicious hash browns, plus tea or coffee for a true breakfast of champions. Two crust sandwiches for just $4, available until 10.30 weekdays and 11 a.m. on weekends. Only at Burger King, 7 Mile Beach, Waterfront, Walkers Road, Town Center Plaza, and now Red Bay. Welcome back to the Clifton Hunter High School, where we have three of the candidates for East End Electoral District with us this evening. They're at, at, they're at respond to a series of questions from the Chamber of Commerce, and soon we have questions also submitted from the audience. But we're not, right now we're on question number nine. I'm going to turn it back over to President Kyle Broadhurst to, answer, to ask the next question. For those keeping score at home, it's question number 10, but Mr. Rankin, and we're going to start this round of questions with you. The financial services sector is responsible for contributing more than half of the government's revenue and employs more Caymanians than any other industry. What steps do you think should be taken to protect, develop, and promote the industry? So, sorry, can you repeat that again? The financial services sector is responsible for contributing more than half of the government's revenue and employs more Caymanians than any other industry. What steps do you think should be taken to protect, develop, and promote the industry? The financial sector is the biggest contributor of GDP, as you have indicated. It, um, I think it contributes something near 60%. Um, they're, they're pretty much under attack from, from the whole regulatory regime around the world. Um, then with the issue regarding Brexit, not knowing what's going to come of that and how it will affect us in Europe, we, we have to, we're going to have to plan and figure out how we're going to deal with all these regulatory issues from the European Union and all the, all the other tax regulatory bodies around the world. How we deal with that, I guess, is, is through legislative means and also seeing where we can get assistance from the UK once they leave Brexit because obviously with them in the, U, in the European Union before Brexit, they were kind of our um, saviors per se. But Right now, we, we, don't, we won't have that in another few years, and we need to figure out how we're going to deal with that. But to tell you right now, um, it, it's pretty much up in the air. Thank you. Mr. McLean, Jr. The financial services sector is responsible for contributing more than half of the government's revenue and employs more Caymanians than any other industry. What steps do you think should be taken to protect, develop, and promote the industry? In, in regards to, the, to that, uh, I think that we need to stand up against the external forces that force our financial industry into signing different treaties um, that are not honestly not applicable to this jurisdiction, in my opinion. And I think the government needs to look into that because, uh, you know, the white paper was one of them, and that's just to get information out from the Cayman Islands, and we cannot even, you know, get information from those countries. If, the, if we can give information, they should supposed to give us information also. And the government needs to stand up to protect our financial industry. And in turn, I think more investors will be more confident in the Cayman Islands for, that, for those reasons. Thank you. Mr. McLean, the financial services sector is responsible for contributing more than half of the government's revenue, employs more Caymanians than any other industry. What steps do you think should be taken to protect, develop, and promote the industry? Let me, say, let me say first that despite what my two opponents may believe, we are the most compliant country in the world when it comes to finance offshore, offshore centers. Um, we have been in many instances used as a guinea pig to make sure the rest of the world follows. But we cannot object as strenuously as they would like 
my opponents to, to, to matters relating to the G8, G20, um, and importantly to England. However, one of the things that I want to see us do with the financial industry, which I proposed when I was a minister, is that government and the financial industry share equal responsibility and resources, financial resources, to develop a Cayman finance. I, I think at the time I was saying Cayman reform, financial reform. Um, the, the private sector went ahead and, and, and created a, an institution called Cayman Finance. I want that to be the first line for us to go out there into the world and deal with it, and then the government comes behind. But we need to share that expense. If it's $10 million to run Cayman Finance, if we want to call it that, then the Cayman Islands contribute half of it, and the financial industry contribute the other. Right now, this government has given Cayman Finance 300,000, and it costs hundreds, millions, to run Cayman Finance. We need to enhance it, we need to protect it, but we need frontline in the form of, of joint relationship and joint efforts on the part of the government and then the financial industry. They pay half of it and we pay the other half and we appoint people on there just like they do. Thank you. Mr. McLean, Jr., this question will start with you. Restoration of our severely overfished reef fish population is a matter of great urgency as some species are facing local extinction. If elected, would you support a proposal that is currently before government to impose fishing limits and bans on some species to restore the local reef fish population? I would, I, I would have to concur with, with the local fishermen, especially my district first, but for too long they, their voices have been neglected because of the dive industry. They're, in my opinion, they're, they're very one-sided and you know, they come up with this scientists saying this and scientists saying that versus listening to the local fishermen. The local fishermen, I will stand by them throughout whatever is proposed because it's their livelihood, it's our tradition. Um, in regards to, to, to doing protection, I'm all for protection, but when it steps on people's bread and butter, uh, we have to take another look at it and consider their, their livelihood first and foremost. Thank you. Mr. McLean, restoration of our severely overfished reef fish population is a matter of great urgency as some species are facing local extinction. If elected, would you support a proposal that is currently before government to impose fishing limits and bans on some species to restore the local reef fish population? I, I can't support total ban on, on, on species that unless, of course, they're in, in, in such dire strait that we have scientific data to, to, to prove that. I, I support catch limits like anywhere else in the world because what we have here is we are heavily dependent upon tourism and tourism is, is, is a part of tourism is the marine environment. You know, that's, that's why people come here in the majority of cases. Um, but then we also have to make provisions for those who make a livelihood off of, of, of fishing because we do have people here who make a livelihood from fishing. And there are, there are, there are some proposals that I do not agree with. I believe that we, we need to look at them and see what kind of catch limits that needs to be placed on them. As a matter of fact, all fishermen that I've ever talked to agree with catch limits because what we're having is we passed a law, an amendment to the marine conservation law since I've been a member of parliament where um, expats were not allowed to fish without a license and nobody implemented it because they say it's discrimination um, then all Caymanians should have the same thing that you have to get a license. Well, it's time now that we need to stop people from raping our marine life in order that it's be, it is sustainable for the future to maintain that pillar of our economy, which is tourism. I cannot support total ban unless we can scientifically prove that it is in such decline 
or it is declining so fast that we need to stop it. Because remember what I said, extinction is forever. Eh? Thank you. Mr. Rankin, restoration of our severely overfished reef fish population is a matter of great urgency as some species are facing local extinction. If elected, would you support a proposal that is currently before government to impose fishing limits and bans on some species to restore the local reef fish population? If elected, I would not support outright bans. Um, limits is something that we can consider. And certainly, um, if, if we had a ban, if we had to go down the route of a ban, it couldn't be in perpetuity. It has to be some definitive date once we can tell that the population of whatever fish we've we've actually banned people from catching has grown back. Now, Mr. McLean had said, um, referred to legislation some time back where we, where it was passed and was against um, foreign people coming in and fish. I, I would support that because we need to protect our fishermen and if everybody's coming in catching fishes without any limits in regards to size or number of fish, we will deplete the fish around our country and thereby it will then move into a situation where we have to ban fishing on some species and that hurts our local fishermen. Thank you. Mr. McLean, this next round of questions will start with you. What is your vision for the development of East End over the next four years? And if elected, what do you plan to do to bring this vision to fruition? Um, I, I, I believe that East End is poised for a hotel. We don't have a hotel, per se, in East End. We have the, the timeshare, um, but that cannot be considered a, a full-fledged hotel. I believe East End is, is poised for at least one hotel. Um, I know there are a, a, a few pieces of property in East End that, that can accommodate a full-fledged hotel. I would like to see a five-star hotel in, in the district of East End. When, and, and, and more importantly, when, when um, I was a part of the government, we had an initiative called the East, East, Go East Initiative. Um, that was never supported after I left office in 2009. I want us to revisit that because there are, there are a number of areas that I believe EastEnders can become entrepreneurs, small businesses in the tourism sector. Um, but I want it to be sustainable. I, I, I want development to be sustainable. I do not want to run away like we have on West Bay Beach where everybody is putting up buildings. East End is only five stories. I fought against them being in Ohio. I, I, I wanted three, but I, I, I had to compromise the five stories. Um, we need to, to bring development that is conducive to the, the Eastern environment, not something that we are going to put a, a, a concrete jungle in Eastern. And, and I believe a, a hotel, and I believe now the time has come for um, the, the a small, one or two small boutique hotels and, 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 and bed and breakfast. I think those things will, 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 will all go well with our people in Eastern and the environment within Eastern within and, and, and putting them right in the environment, like how Shetta has done with, with the hospital, that the environment around it, the, the natural environment around it stays in place as much as possible. Thank you. Mr. Rankin, what is your vision for the development of East End over the next four years? And if elected, what do you plan to do to bring this vision to fruition? My vision for development in East End, it has to be good for the district. It must fit with the whole facade of East End. And if I'm elected, I would like to see some buildings um, of hotels, um, as Mr. McLean has said. Also, we, small business is one of the biggest contributors of employment of individuals in this country. And we need to make it conducive and let people know that East End is open for business and that we will invite them with open arms once they do what's good for East End and once they do what's good for the environment. Thank you. Mr. McLean, Jr., what is your vision for the development of East End over the next four years? And if elected, what do you do, what do you plan to do to bring this vision to fruition? Well, my signs on the roadside says a lot. 
Um, I would like to see like the blowholes developed, not touching the blowholes itself, but across the street um, into a nice bar restaurant slash uh, craft market because the tourist needs to to get a better product when they go out to East End and know what they're looking after. I'm um, thank God for Mr. Allen being out there daily to talk to them about the history of East End, and also by the record of ten sales, I envision that to have a very large ship with 10 sails on it, and then on the, sh on the sails, having the names of the ships that wrecked on, on the reefs, along with a craft market and bays that they can sell their crafts, like Miss Carmen, Miss Graciela, and the likes. That would be sustainable in income for my people in East End. Um, developing that park alone will help to reduce the unemployment in, in the district. Yes, I would say one more hotel, we could handle. Um, beyond that, for the next 10 years, I wouldn't support it. Uh, I just think that the hotels that are there are sufficient, but we need to ensure that the people working there um, are our locals from the district. That has been a, a major issue for years, and again, I reiterate that I would be working strongly with the Immigration Department to reduce the work permit holders there and to ensure people are put first. But after doing the record of 10 sales, development, I think that in itself will, will suffice the need for our people to get jobs in the district. Thank you. Mr. Rankin, this next round of questions will start with you. If elected, what would, would you be willing to accept a ministerial seat? And if yes, what areas of responsibility would you want to be assigned? If elected, I'd certainly be willing to accept a ministerial seat. No. It would have to be a seat where I can use my experience in my professional life and all of my, uh, my experience in my professional life, but also I'd have to be very careful because all my, my experience is in telecoms. I certainly wouldn't want a telecom ministry, but I'd have to use the experience of my business. However, as that's kind of hypothetical at this point, I'd certainly have to go back to my committee and we discuss it from there. Thank you. Mr. McLean, Jr. If elected, would you be willing to accept a ministerial seat? And if yes, what areas of responsibility would you want to be assigned? Definitely. Um, I would definitely like to be a minister for agriculture, sports, and roads. They are my fields. I have been in agriculture all my life. I still raise goats as a um, part-time. Sports, I've been an average uh, volleyball player for years. And being in those positions that I can expand on those and support my people in East End, especially when it comes to support from the Department of Agriculture, because before you could have them come up and look at your animals without charge. Now they're charging you. Sports, I would like to see international players come down from wherever in the world to compete against our locals and vice versa, sending them overseas. And roads, I would continue to develop um, the roads throughout the district in regards to the 286 acres, the Fudland Farms, I would like to see roads through that and, and lease that out to my people in the district, especially in supporting agriculture throughout the, throughout the island. Thank you. Mr. McLean, if elected, would you be willing to accept a ministerial seat? And if yes, what areas of responsibility would you want to be assigned? I am extremely capable of handling the premiership of this country. And, um, and in, in the absence of that, and I have to, to, to take another seat, I believe that I have proven myself in communications, works, and infrastructure. And unlike Mr. Mr. Rankin, I don't have a conflict. He obviously has a conflict. He said he wouldn't be able to take that. I, I can take any ministerial seat and be successful in it because of the experiences that I have gained over the last 16 years. Um, but why settle for that, that uh, uh, ministerial seat, just a mere ministerial speed, seat, when I have the longevity and experience to be the premier of this country where I can get more done? Thank you. This next round of questions start with you, Mr. McLean, Jr. Healthcare costs continue to increase for businesses and residents. 
and has become one of the highest expense items in the national budget. What reforms, if any, would you propose to address the situation? Health care, huh. yeah, tell me about it. Um, in regards to the health care, I think t to reduce the cost of health care, we need to stop relying on importation of, of drugs from you know, the U.S. We need to actually look for cheaper drugs and also in, invite other competitors, other insurance companies to come down here and, and be more competitive with the local ones that we have here in order to drive the cost down. And I will definitely support um, health care for all to the age of 18 um, without cost to the people. I think government uh, should be able to, to foot that bill and, and continue to, to help our people in regards to the giving them the best health care there is. Thank you. Mr. McLean, health care costs continue to increase for businesses and residents and has become one of the highest expense items in the national budget. What reforms, if any, would you propose to address this situation? I, I believe, and I've, I've publicly stated that it, I believe that Cynico should be turned into a national insurance, where everybody's insured on the Cynico. And what the problem we're having with the cost of health care is that we, we are allowing the insurances to, to dictate what the cost of health care. Whilst we need to recognize that the few that have catastrophic illnesses are few in number, and then the majority of those insured should be covering those. And, and the cost of health care has gone through, through the roof because we are killing the people who utilize the health care. What about the thousands? The, the insurance system, what about the thousands who do not ever go to the hospital until they're in their 60s and 70s? All those need to be, are, are the ones who are carrying the, 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 the health care. But we are picking out those few at the top and we are refusing to insure them and the likes. Um, I am not totally advocating an Obamacare but certainly certain aspects of Obamacare would, would look good in this country where it's mandated that you cannot refuse people insurance and there is a cap on it. That needs to happen and it needs to happen fast or we're going to throw health care through the roof much further than it currently is. Thank you. Mr. Rankin. Health care costs continue to increase for businesses and residents and has become one of the highest expense items in the national budget. What reforms, if any, would you propose to address the situation? Like Mr. McLean, Starred McLean, I also believe that national health insurance should be seriously considered. The health insurance cost to many of our citizens is eating up so much of their salary. I mean, an average person would say, family of four, the insurance can be well over $1,200. And we need to find a way to put some of that money back into their pockets so they can have some disposable income. Now, again, agreeing with Mr. McLean, Cynico should be the driver of the national health insurance. How we get there, we'd have to, of course, figure out how to rein in the, what seems to be a runaway train that's been run by the insurance companies. Thank you. We're going to take a short break. We're live at the Clifton Hunter High School for the first of 19 Chamber of Commerce candidates forums. For this one for the District of East End. We'll be right back after this short commercial break. Children are our future, so let's preserve the ecosystems of Cayman by using cleaner gas. Using propane releases 80% fewer harmful emissions into the environment and saves you significantly on your energy spent annually. 
Working with us during the entire process and our outstanding customer service will make you know that you made the right choice. By partnering with ProSolar, we are also able to provide solutions for zero net energy homes. Clean gas, superior energy, the smarter choice. Turn around! We'll find whoever did this awful thing. He's hiding something. I'm telling you, Morgan is dangerous. The pain will come when Deb finally understands who her brother really is. Rita's horror, the kid's tears. Dear Carrie, <clears throat> you are nothing less to me than a big... <laughs> Where were you going with that? I don't know. I'm getting wired from chewing all this Nicorette. All right, all right. Just work with what you got. Come on. I'm not wrong. It's his real name. Have you ever in your life met anyone named Boy R.D.? <laughs> Beach Resort and Spa. Welcome back to the Clifton Hunter High School, where we're with three of the candidates from the Electoral District of East End. This is the first of 19 Chamber of Commerce candidates forums. So I'm going to toss it back to President Kyle Broadhurst. Now we will be, you know, he'll be ask, answer, uh, submitting questions to the candidates from the audience. And I'd like to thank you. Okay. Um, I think we're starting with Mr. Arden McLean with this question. The question is, what is your view on the recent change to expat pensions? Do you believe that this will have a negative impact on the tourism product of Grand Cayman? I think maybe we need to broaden that a little bit too, as to w what impact do you think that it'll have? Personally, I, um, I don't think it will have an impact greater than what it has, it has always had. Because after two years, I think it, it was, you could, you could draw on your, your, your pension. Um, what has happened now is that the changes that have, have been brought about will, will require them to take that pension and put it in another pension overseas wherever they go to work. So we will know for sure that that pension is utilized for the purposes that it, it was, to protect that person when they reach in their old age, like we, do, like we will, um, if we will live long enough, and, and that's the only difference it is. Prior to this, they could take it, draw it down after being away for a couple of years, and then it would be gone anyway. Now what happens is that they are allowed to take it, but they must transfer it into another uh, pension plan elsewhere in the world, wherever they are going to work. So the impact on, on, on our economy is not going to be any different. It may be a shorter period of time as opposed to the two years that it was before. It may be an immediate one, but still we were going to lose that money anyway. Thank you. Mr. Rankin, what is your view of the recent change to the expat pensions? Do you believe that this will, be, this will have a negative impact on the tourism product of Grand Cayman or, or generally? I don't believe the recent changes would have any significant impact to, to us in Cayman. The, uh, and, and because, I mean, the pensions are not really invested here, so it won't have that significant impact to us. However, the requirement to, to have the persons transferred to an, another pension scheme in their own home country is something that, that it will be used, as Mr. McLean said, used for what it was designed for. 
Thank you. Mr. McLean, Jr., what is your view on the recent change to expat pensions? Do you believe that this will have a negative impact on the tourism product of Grand Cayman or generally? No, I don't think it will have a, ne a negative impact. And um, in regards to them getting their pension when they're leaving the island, I think that they should be able to utilize the pension the way that they want to. Uh, I, I don't think we should be dictating what they do, what the pension, where the pension goes after they leave the island. That's my opinion. Thank you. Mr. Rankin, uh, this round of questions will start with you. Do you support district councils and why? How would you propose to structure the council should it be mandated? I support district councils. District, I support the, for the reason that the MLA or the elected representative can't be all places at once. And through the district council, which will help him manage the district more effectively. I would use a very democratic process similar to the elections to en enact um, a district council, for example, for East End. And using that process, obviously, use a process that, that would create some kind of structure within it that the MLA will be assisted greatly by that district council. Thank you. Mr. McLean, Jr., do you support district councils and why? How would you propose to structure the council should it be mandated? Yes, I certainly do. Um, we, with the district council, uh, I think that it will be very beneficial in all districts because you can have different people heading up different departments in, in regards to agriculture, tourism, finance, fishing, and that information will be able to trickle right on up to the MLA that he would be able to be well, well aware of what's going on in his constituents and be able to address the matters better versus just having um, the whole district as a whole contacting him. And at times it's unfortunate that, you know, he's in Delhi and he cannot be reached. And I'm not beating up on Mr. McLean here. Um, and in no way I'm just being honest about the situation. I think that it, we need to, to have a demand in the district for, for all districts in order to be well aware of what's going on. Thank you. Mr. McLean, do you support district councils and why? How would you propose to structure the council should it be mandated? I absolutely have to support district council because I was part of the constitutional discussions and I supported it then and proposed it at the, then. Um, I believe what 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 we are creating here is a local government uh, where the, the, the local people participate much more in the government. The last government, the previous administration, not the immediate one, uh, did the law which the constitution calls for that we have to do a law to, to establish councils. And what they did was they, they wanted cabinet to appoint the council members um, and MLAs, they didn't even have there that ordinary MLAs would be able to, to, to um, appoint somebody or recommend someone. Eventually, they, they conceded on that point. And what happened is that you cannot appoint people to these boards because you're going to appoint the people who support you. I want to see it done through the democratic process, even if that's midterm, where this election now is 2017. This could be done in 2019 for four-year periods. And that way, whoever get elected has to work at least two years with that, with that, with, with that council. Um, and I do not believe that it needs to be onerous with 10, 12 people. You only need three people in the district that put themselves up to be elected to that council because it's merely an advisory council now, if we extend that to where the, we, we, we uh, give them a budget to do the minor stuff, like I heard the Premier saying the other night, then there, there is a need for a much deeper structure, offices and the likes. But then we're, we're, we're merging into the local government that most independent countries have. And I don't have a problem with that, but I don't think it need for more than three people. Thank you. Mr. McLean, Jr., the question has a comment first, but then a question, but it's no candidate has, no candidate has indicated concern about the cost of living. The cost of fuel, food, et cetera, continues to increase daily. 
What would you do if elected to address the cost of living for the average Caymanian? Well, we need to look at the, the custom fees and, or taxes, whatever you want to call them, and try to reduce them, especially when it comes to the consuming and foods and et cetera. Um, in regards to importation of cars, uh, it, it's a, it's a catch-21 with that because uh, as a car dealer myself, uh, you, you would want it to be reduced, but yet the government has to make the revenue off of it. But in re regards to getting you know, cheaper things for the people of the, of the country, um, after revisiting the custom laws I, and, and taxes, I think that we can find avenues that would benefit all, benefit all in, re in regards to reducing those fees. Thank you. Mr. Ard McLean, I'm, I'm going to skip the comment here and just ask you the question, which is, what would you do if elected to address the cost of living for the average Caymanian? I would do exactly what I've been calling for all along, the rebalancing of duties and fees. Um, I believe the time has come for us to comprehensively look at all our fees and tax structure in this country because it's indirect taxation as we like to call it. Um, but I believe over the years what we have done is whenever we want revenue, we find one tax that we haven't put it on in the last 20 years or the last 10 years and we load it up and get that revenue because we see, for instance, the importation of cars. We see that as a lot of cars are coming in. We look at it and we, we load that up, not considering the other issues that needs to be addressed. There is time now for us to rebalance all of those fees and, and make them be much fairer in, in, in order that the middle class and the lower, lower class get a better shot at a at a well-reasoned cost of living. The, the, the fee is, for instance, we have bread and, and certain staples that does not have any tax on them. But there are other issues, quote unquote, sin tax, so to speak, the, that has lower taxes than is desirable. And if we do not try to balance them, we're going to load up a few, and then we're going to kill that sector of society, whether they are rich or middle class, and, 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 and no one will have the opportunity for fairness across the board and equality in taxes. Thank you. Mr. Rankin, what would you do if elected to address the cost of living for the average Caymanian? Well, I agree with um, one of the approach by Mr. McLean in terms of rebalancing our all of the taxes, we also have to look at stuff that's more, that's going to impact the average Caymanians even more and put disposable income back in their pockets. Two of the highest impacting costs to the average Caymanian is health care and fuel. The fuel affects pretty much every single thing in this economy. And the health care, it causes such a big chunk of, of, of monies from someone's wages that's a big effect as well. However, using those two items and managing the cost where we can, where, where we can reduce the impact it has to the average Cayman and will help put back money in their pocket. Thank you. Mr. McLean, the questions are going to start with you. This is an issue outside your district, but a national issue. Do you support or oppose the construction of a cruise birthing facility in Georgetown? Um, I don't um, have an opinion one way or the other on whether or not we need cruise facilities. Um, and I have made that known to the public, I've made it known to the minister. However, if we need to put in cruise facilities, then the issue of, of, of dredging Georgetown Harbor needs to come off the table. I have, I have discussed with the, the consultants, I've discussed with the, 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 the minister, and we can build that, that dock, those docks if we need them, on pylons and take them far enough out in the ocean that we need not dredge not uh, Georgetown Harbor. Um, it appears like it was all gloom and doom for the last few years, uh, saying that if we didn't get a dock, we weren't going to get any more tourists. 
as he fires six ships in Georgetown. So we have to decide whether or not we're going to go through all that expense when the ships are still coming. And, 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 and we, we, the issue has always been, been the big class celebrity ships, I think they're, they're called. But we're doing pretty good without them, aren't we? Why are we going to go through the, the expense of three, four hundred million dollars to build a dock? If we need it, if we think that's going to enhance the, the product and, and enhance the, the, uh, the arrivals, then absolutely let's do it. But we need to do it in such a way that it's sustainable and we do not destroy, overly destroy too much of the environment in the middle of Georgetown. Despite what we may think that the Georgetown Harbor has already did, quote unquote, of marine life, there is still a value to that harbor, to the in marine environment. And I do not propose destroying it the way they wanted to do it initially. Thank you. Mr. Rankin, do you support or oppose the construction of a cruise berthing facility in Georgetown? I too is of two minds of, of building a cruise ship in Georgetown. One, one, of, one, one of the reasons why I'm kind of hesitant is that we still don't know how much it's going to cost us across this country to build a cruise dock. The, the second issue I have with it is, again, while I agree with Mr. McLean, and I've had the benefit of diving out there as a scuba diver, the place is pretty much dead, but the effect that it would have further down the line on Seven Mile Beach and stuff could be quite dramatic. Now, the other thing that we need to consider as well is that while Mr. McLean indicates there were five ships in town today, what happens when they start to retire those ships? What happens when they replace those ships with bigger ships that is not going to come here because we don't have a, a pier, all right? And then we start to see the trickle-down economic um, disaster, per se, that it would create if we don't have tourism coming here. However, if we have to do it, we must find a way to do it that is going to be sustainable, not only to our economic well-being, but also to the environment. Thank you. Mr. McLean, Jr., do you support or oppose the construction of a cruise berthing facility in Georgetown? Yes, sir. I definitely support it. I think that for too long, um, the last three governments in particular have been using it as a, as a political football, and it just needs to be done. Uh, we have had at least two environmental impact studies done, to my knowledge, and it has cost the government great money. I think that we need to do a joint venture with a private company. I was hoping, for example, the Chinese developers that wanted to do it would come in line and, and that it would have come to fruition. And when money is coming into the countries, it could have been a 50-50 um, collection that the government would have been able to get some revenue from it on the onset until the Chinese or any developer for that matter has been fully repaired, but yes, I do support it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rankin, this question, round of questions, we'll start with you. <clears throat> the current constitution has been operational since 2009. What changes do you believe needs to be made for better governance? If I could repeat that, the last part of it. The current cost constitution has been operational since 2009. What changes do you believe need to be made for better governance, and I suppose, if any? Um, currently, I, I can't think of any, and I've reviewed it a couple of times, I can't think of any outright changes that I would make to it. Um, certainly, it, it's only been there for a short space of time, less than 10 years, and we don't want to s give it a bit longer to see what other changes we need to be, not just start making changes in an ad hoc manner. Thank you. Mr. McLean, the current constitution has been operational since 2009. What changes do you believe need to be made for better governance, and again, if any? I think that in regards to, to that, uh, it needs to be tuned in respect of what we believe in as a nation, especially when it comes to the human rights and gay rights into this country. Um, that section needs to be addressed and altered to completely fit our jurisdiction. I, uh, I, I do not support gay marriages, and I'll publicly state that tonight. And I will not encourage anyone to who is elected because it, it goes against our tradition, it goes against the Bible. And I'm not perfect, but I do believe in my Bible. Um, 
in my opinion, I, I just think that it needs to be fine-tuned to, to accommodate our traditional values. Thank you. Mr. McLean, the current constitution has been operational since 2009. What changes do you believe need to be made for better governance, if any? Well, there are a number, but just for the benefit of my good friend here, the constitution requires marriage between a man and a woman. <clears throat> so I don't see where we need to change that right now. Um, there are a number of areas, one in particular that, that we, we, we experienced in the last election, where I think it, section four to nine, the appointment of premiers. And it says, gain the majority. Whether, and that needs to be properly defined, gained in, 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 uh, in the election, or subsequent. Remember, Ms. Giuliano went and joined him so he could get the 10, the majority. That needs to be changed because the next provision in it says you have to go to the legislative assembly if no one has gained it in the, in the, in the. So we need, to, we need to review that area. The other area, we are right now in the middle of an election and qualifications for, for, for membership of the legislative assembly. Okay, we want our, our people to go overseas and we want them to make sure they're back here and don't spend four, 400, day, the last, 400 days out of the last uh, seven years overseas. What benefit is that to us? We, 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 we really need to look at it. And I, I will be the first to admit that at the time, we mirrored what was in the old constitution, um, the 72 constitution. Now the time has come for us to change that because what we're doing is disenfranchising the very Caymanians that we want to go overseas to train to come back here and run the country and to, and to govern the country. We just went through the Legal Practitioners Bill and most of the country will know that I did not support outsourcing the, our laws at one stage, but now I am a convert. But why are we sending out people over there if they can't come back and give us the benefit because of the Constitution, the provision of the Constitution. We want them to run. Those are the people we want to run. And they can't because Thank of you. that 400 day um, restriction on them. Thank you, Mr. McLean. The next round of questions will start with Mr. McLean, Jr. Um, do you support or oppose the introduction of gaming casinos? Why or why not? And if you do support, would you make them available exclusively to tourists? In regards to that, I, I personally gamble myself off island. You know, I'm not going to beat around the bush. I think that it needs to be seriously looked after because, as far as I can see, you got Rotary, Lions, and other clubs that are doing raffles, and that is a part of gambling, in my opinion, along with even churches. I think it's high time that we take the bull by the horns, and I don't, I wouldn't have a, a problem supporting it. I'll be straight up and honest with you. That's my, that's my heartfelt reason because once it's, it's monitored properly by the government, that it's, you know, it's not being taken advantage by whoever is doing the, the, the raffles or stuff, I, I think it's, it'll be beneficial to some people in the island. Thank you. Mr. McLean, do you support or oppose the introduction of gaming casinos? Why or why not? And if you do support, would you make them available exclusively to tourists? Available to tourists. To tourists? Yes. Oh, oh, I thought you were saying locals. Um, um, I, I believe the time has come that we, 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 we make a, de a definitive decision on this matter. And, 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 and by that I mean we need to get a, a referendum on this matter and decide one time and, and deal with it. If that referendum comes back and say that the majority of the population agrees with, with, um, with gambling, then we need to do it. Because the gambling will be beneficial to the economy of this country. Of course it must be to tourists. Uh, that's where the money's at. Um, when you go into Bahamas, uh, uh, you, it is tourists that do, that gamble the most in those, those things. Now there was, we should remember St. Kitts, 
St. Kitts started out with Jack Tarr gambling, and, and, and Jack Tarr, they, the locals were, pre, were prevented from, from gambling. They then went and, and, and did Marriott next door, and they gave them a license, and tourists were the only ones allowed, and eventually they had to change that to allow the locals to come in. Now, that, that has to be a decision made by the populace of this country. It needs to be done through a referendum, and once that, it may be an issue for an election cycle, uh, an, uh, an election day that we, we put it on the ballot whether or not you support gambling, casino gambling in the country. And whatever that referendum is, then I believe the country needs to move in that direction. Thank you. Mr. Rankin, do you support or oppose the introduction of gaming casinos? Why or why not? And if you do support, would you make them available exclusively to tourists? Like Mr. McLean, I believe that that question needs to be best answered by a referendum. Now, I think many of us know the benefits and the revenue that government can derive from gambling, but I think it's, it goes to more than just an approval of gambling. It, it, there's some morality issues around that, especially with, with the kind of Christian heritage that we've come from. But I also believe that it's time that we look at it and see if the country is ready to move in that direction, and the only how we can do that is by looking and having it done through a referendum. Thank you. Mr. McLean, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question to that. And if it were the case that a referendum were to approve casino gambling here in the Cayman Islands, would you support a casino being put in East End? Absolutely. Absolutely. I would support it anywhere. But the decision is not mine. And, and, and you know, I recently was saying to someone that, that there's an ideal place to put a, a casino right there past the, the shopping center across from the governor's on the highway. That's a perfect piece of land there if the country decides they're going that way. Um, that's cost you less, I think it is. Just past cost you less on the, the highway. And, and I believe that the hotels can be restructured into casinos. Um, you know, one of the things, we need to stop being hypocritical in this country. We go overseas and we do it, but when we come home, we say we shouldn't do it. We, we need to stop being hypocritical. Last time I gambled must have been about three, four years ago, and I used $32, and that was it. That was enough. I am not a gambler, but I have no problem with it if you want to do it. That's entirely up to you. Thank you. Mr. Rankin, the question is, if there was a referendum approving gambling, would you support a casino being established in East End? While I would support it being established in East End, yes. I know it would provide jobs and stuff, hopefully, for the people of East End. However, I'd have to be guided by my constituents if they'd want it there. Okay, thank you. Mr. McLean, Jr., same question. So if there was a referendum that approved of, or allowed for casino gambling, would you support a casino being established in East End? At this time, I don't think uh, the population of East End would sustain it, so I think it would be fruitless to do it in East End. Uh, I think it's better in, in Georgetown to test the waters in any case. But if, it, if a developer comes up there and wants to do it, I, I will, you know, once the people uh, out here and wants, wants it done and wants it in East End, of course, I will support it. Well, th thank you. Well, thank you very much. We're going to take uh, our final commercial break, and when we come back, we'll have the closing remarks from the candidates and the closing statement by the president. We'll be right back. Some say the time of miracles has passed, but we see miracles all around us every day. Some could not walk. Some could not breathe. Some had lost all hope. But something amazing happened, something that can't be analyzed or quantified, something that is more than good medicine. Holy Cross. C3 Pure Fiber broke the Caymanian record of the first 100% fiber optic network. Do you know what it feels like to be fiber fast? It feels like this, like your whole life passing beneath your fingertips, like your world is living with you. 
like everything in your whole life is always connected. We are a new breed of connectivity and we are ready for you. TV from 59, internet from 69, bundles from 89, and home phone from 9. Join us today, 333-3333 or c3.ky. Waste Carriers is your complete waste management company. We service commercial, residential, and construction properties. With our large inventory of dumpsters and grapple truck services, we provide an unmatched, dependable service. Our sister company, Island Recycling, buys and collects recyclables such as AC units, aluminum cans, auto batteries, copper, and much, much more. For Cayman's Waste and Recycling Solution, one call takes care of it all. Call 946-DUMP. That's 946-3867. Seven Mile Beach Resort and Spa. Welcome back to the Clifton Hunter High School, where we have three candidates for the Electoral District of East End. We've now reached the conclusion of the question time. And now each of the candidates will have two minutes for a closing statement. This evening we'll begin with Mr. Rankin. I've asked, oh sorry. I've asked the people of East End, um, humbly applying for the job to be their representative. I know I have the will, the tenacity, and the desire to help make East End a better place through change. We can only do that with the support of the people and once elected, the support of the elected government. We must look at the areas of concern in East End, that is education, our youth and elders, and driving economic development that is sustainable and good for the District of East End. We must have a clear vision and must have a relationship management strategy that is clear and concise and that will also bring meaningful change to East End in such a way that we know that our district can sustain and move forward for the next 10 years. Thank you. Mr. John McLean, Jr., closing remarks. To the people of East End, I would like to say thank you for even giving me the opportunity to be your candidate. First and foremost, I would like to thank God for allowing me to be here tonight once again. And I'm asking for your support in this election. It's a crucial election, ladies and gentlemen. I, I'm here to fight hard for you, as I've always done. I'm here to ensure that you're protected by well-needed well jobs that are in the district that you can man. And I will always live in my district, and I will always be here for you, my people. I pray that whoever becomes the next MLA, whether it's the incumbent, Mr. Rankin, that they will take the job seriously and pursue to protect the people of East End and allow them to have their voice heard and to help them in whatever way, shape, or form. And I will be there to assist in whatever way I can if I'm not elected. If I'm elected, I will hit the ground running, and I assure you that you will see a new district in East End and a better district and a better sustainable economy through my leadership because I have you at heart, and I'm there 24 hours all the time with you. Thank you. Mr. Arden McLean. Um, first of all, I think I need to take a piece out of, of my closing remarks to, to say how disappointed I am that this is not held in the district of East End. In the age of technology that is changing daily, you're telling me we're going backwards? These have always been held in East End from 1992. And we are in 2017, and they say the signal can't reach Georgetown. What kind of thing is that? Anyway, that's for another subject, another day. Um, well, I want to thank Chamber of Commerce. 
Borough invite me, Mr. Broadhurst as well. And I want to thank the people of East End for coming out, those who did come. Um, and, and let me say, as, I, as we approach the general election, I invite the people of East End to consider my tenure as their representative in the Legislative Assembly. Consider how I have defended you, how I have advocated on your behalf. I would also ask you to ask the question, why are people from the outside trying to use their resources to remove me from the Legislative Assembly? What terrible thing have I done to my country and to you? Or is it that I cannot be used and want the best for you? Are they looking for someone they can control? Those questions should be asked and they need to be answered. So when you're approached, get good reasons for those questions. The other question that should be asked is, where were my opponents for the last 20 odd years? Where, what have they done? What their contributions are to that district? I submit that I'm the only one here that has always been concerned with the standards well-being and have consistently showed it my entire life. I have the experience and has shown that I can deliver for East End in particular and this country in general. And I ask you for your vote. Well, thank you, Mr. McLean. I now turn it over to President Kyle Broadhurst for closing remarks. On behalf of the Chamber of Commerce and the Chamber of Council, I would like to extend a special thank you to the candidates for participating in tonight's event. You've been peppered with questions all evening, and I think you've given extremely thoughtful answers. And thank you very much for taking your time and your busy schedules to be with us th this evening. I'd also like to thank you all in the audience uh, for attending and engaging with us all this evening. Your questions were thoughtful, and we really appreciate them. A special thank you to Hurley's Media for their support out of the forums and for broadcasting tonight's event live to the Cayman Islands public via Cayman 27 and online and their online video stream. Final, finally, I'd also like to thank our supporting sponsors, the Dart Organization, Deloitte, Foster's IGA, Heritage Holdings and Puritan Cleaners. The next candidates forum will take place tomorrow here at Clifton Hunter High School. Northside candidates will be in attendance, including Edward Chisholm, Justin Ebanks, and Ezard Miller. Thank you for supporting the Chamber of Commerce's candidates forums. Good night and safe travels. All right, buddy. Here, buddy. I Douglas.